What's up, students? I'm excited to start our very first English unit with you guys. I'm super excited about this unit. I'm going to say that about a lot of units over the school year, but this is one of my favorites, and I think that you're going to love it too. We are going to study for our first unit linguistics, and linguistics means language, but it's not the same as studying Spanish or French. Ling studying linguistics is the study of how language works. We can, we're going to talk about things like how language works in our heads, how it helps us think, how language changes, and how language shapes our cultures and our identities, and um, how we use language to like mesh two words together, like I and ball, and those two words come together and mean something different than just the words I or ball by themselves. And the reason why we decided to give you guys a unit on language is because students come to English classes thinking that they can already speak English, they're already good writers, and those things are true. You guys are already probably fluent in English and you're already a good writer. Um, but we're studying English as an art form and it's important to understand, I think, how the language that you use shapes your perceptions of the world, your beliefs, your identities. And I'm going to propose to you that a lot of that is um, built on language. We, our identities are stories that we tell ourselves about who we are. It's, their English is important because it's important that you can send a professional letter to your boss someday with commas in the right places and spelling words correctly. But also, English and language are kind of miraculous. And I learn things, I've been studying English for 10 years now or more, and I learn things every day that blow my mind and change the way I look at the world or change the way I look at myself. So I'm excited to share some of those things with you guys. We'll know when we have um, learned these things because you're going to be able to write a five paragraph essay explaining what language means and why it's important in your life. So every day we're going to answer one essential question like what is language? or why is language important. And then at the end of that day, you're going to write a little paragraph reflection, and at the end of the unit, we're gonna combine all those paragraphs into one essay. So don't lose those paragraphs. All right, here we go. Language, um, this is the color green. We all know that this is the color green. You've probably learned that in preschool. But my question for you today is how do we all know that we're seeing the same thing when we see the color green. Maybe when I look at the color green, what I see is what Ethan would see as the color red. Lang um, colors are abstract. They're not like the word chair because that's a hard concrete thing. Colors exist partly as just language. Um, Language is the only way we have to verify that this color is green. So if I were to ask you, for example, to describe the color green to a blind person, um, what would we say about the color green? I would probably talk about the way it makes me feel. I would say green makes me feel peaceful and calm because I associate the color green with nature. Yeah, we could also talk about associations. I associate green with the earth. Um, you could maybe describe to the person the level of saturation in this color green. I could say it's a dark green or a pale green. Well, actually, no, I couldn't because then, again, I'm describing like dark and pale. And someone who's blind um, wouldn't probably understand dark and pale the way we do. So I might be able to say something like this is a... a thick green. This green is thick like oil as opposed to a thin green like a pale green, a watery green. Um, so I'm going to ask you in Canvas to describe the color red for a blind person, someone who's never seen the color red before. Um, so this is actually an important part of language. I'm going to give you a little hint for an activity that you're going to be doing um, later on. And that is that language has to be able to describe things that are abstract, such as the color green. 
we have to be able to talk about things that are not immediately present in the room with us. For example, if we're talking about a chair, and we don't speak the same language, I can point to this chair and grunt and point to you and gesture, and you can understand that I'm saying, sit down in the chair. Eventually, we'd be able to communicate that with each other. Um, but there are words that are abstract that we wouldn't be able to communicate about without language. For example, emotions. There's been a lot of research that says if we have five words to talk about our emotions, like sad, happy, jealous, angry, then we're going to experience those five emotions differently than we would experience them if we have dozens of words to talk about emotions like envious, bitter, joyful. The more words we have to talk about emotions, the more emotions we can feel. And that's amazing. In fact, I want to talk to you guys more about uh, this idea that the words we have change the way we experience the world and particularly the way we experience things that are abstract. So I'm going to show you this really cool video here and then we're going to talk about it in a minute. to me about this idea is um, what happened with the Himba tribe in Namibia and that is when they looked at a color green or blue I'm trying to find it here when they looked at this color blue right here they couldn't see that color they would stare at that screen for a long time trying to figure out which color was different and um, when they looked at this chart right here, they could immediately identify that this color here was different and I can't do that. I would have to sit here and stare at this for a long time to be able to identify that this is a different color. So the researchers determined that the difference was that they didn't have a word for the color blue, but they had dozens of words for the color green. And this idea um, that language changes the way we see things or our ability to see some things has, an, has a name. It's called the Sapir-Whorf theory. And what's amazing about the Sapir-Whorf theory is that if you think about the implications of this theory, it means that there could be things that exist in the world right now that we don't notice or know about because we can't name them really crazy to think about. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie 
arrivals about a species of alien that comes to Earth and they have to communicate with these aliens and they figure out that the aliens have a language that's circular. Their writing is in circles and so they experience time circularly too and that entire movie is based on uh, the Sapir Whorf theory. So if you get a chance to watch that you should check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I want to talk more about this Sapir Whorf theory, the idea that things exist in certain ways because of the way we talk about them. Um, for example, let's say you have a brother in college and he brings home the third girlfriend he's had this semester and he says, hey, here's my new girlfriend. And you're like, oh, that's cute. That's nice. Whatever. But if he brings home a girl and he says, hey, here's my fiance, then you're going to say, oh, now this is starting to get interesting. Um, even if the, the person hasn't changed, the difference between a girlfriend and a fiance changes the concept of their relationship in your mind. So we have different words for like girlfriend, fiance, wife, those are all different concepts. But what if someone has been, um, let's say in a committed relationship with somebody for 15 years and they have three kids together and they say, hey, this is my girlfriend. That's, ooh, that's kind of a different concept than your brother who's brought home his third girlfriend in one semester. But we don't have a word for that concept of that relationship or oh, this one. Sometimes we do have words for things that maybe shouldn't be distinguished like um, Mrs. versus Miss. The person's the same. We don't have different titles for a man who's married versus a man who's not married, but we do have different words for a woman who's married or a woman who's not married. And that's kind of charged like does a woman's identity change? Does the person change because of the title being Mrs. or Miss? Um, it's interesting that we distinguish between those two things. I'm trying to think, oh, here's one that drives me bonkers. It drives me bonkers when my mom calls me her child because I'm not a child. I am like, I don't want to tell you how old I am, but I am definitely not a child in English. We don't have a word for an adult offspring, but they do have that word in other languages. Um, or we have special words for a child who has lost their parents. We call them an orphan or a spouse who has lost their partner. We call them a widower or a widow, but we don't have a word for an adult, a parent who has lost a child. There's no separate distinction for that. And this is just kind of a weird word to be missing when you have words like widower or orphan. So I want you to think about, um, yeah, I bet you've never thought about words that you don't have before, but they're there and they exist. And I, I think if you spend a little bit of time thinking about them, you'll start to realize that there are concepts that maybe you haven't, you don't think a lot about because you don't have words for it. There are, in other languages, words that we don't use in English. And there's this adorable little book I'll put up on our board so that you can look at it if you're in the classroom. This book is full of words that exist in other languages that don't exist in English. And I'm going to share a couple of them with you uh, in Icelandic. There's a word for weather that looks beautiful when you're inside, but when you go outside, it's actually terrible. That seems like that would be a thing in Iceland, a big part of your consciousness that you should have a word for. Um, in the Hopi Native American language, there's a word for nature that is out of balance or a way of life so crazy it cannot continue long term. What I love about these words is that they're cultural. In Iceland, they would have a word for nature that looks nicer than it is. In Hopi, they would have a word for nature that's out of balance. This one's my favorite. It's in Finland. There's a word for the distance a reindeer can travel before it needs to use the bathroom. We don't have that word in English, but maybe we should. Um, I'm going to find one or two more. Oh, in Scotland, there's a turtle, a word for the hesitation because you have forgotten someone's name. I do that a lot at the beginning of the school year. I'm sorry. It's a good word to have. Okay, um, 
So I want you to be thinking about words that do exist and words that don't exist. And that's hard to do because we don't have words for things that don't exist, even though there are things that don't exist that we do, don't have words for. Um, if you speak another language, maybe you can already think of some of these. I want you to find a word that exists in another language, but not in English. Or you can think of a concept that you think should have a word, but doesn't, like a child who, or a parent who has lost a child. And I want you to list them in our Canvas classroom underneath the think of a word assignment. Um, if you can't think of any, use the internets good for those kind of things. Look up a word that doesn't exist in the English language. Okay, um, our first activity we're gonna start um, will be about coming up with a definition of language, so we'll do that next. Can't wait to see what kind of words you guys come up with and how you would describe the color red to a blind person. Get those assignments done by the end of the week and we'll be back to studying language soon.